Uh, I'm Vincenzo Tursi, and I work for, for NIME. Uh, I'm really excited of, for being here. So it's my first time in India, my first ODSC conference, so really great. So uh, today I would like to introduce you about a project I've been working on with, uh, with my team this year, the beginning, beginning of this year, and it's about a teacher boat. So what we thought uh, was that, so we wanted to give, so we came up with this idea. We wanted to give to the new NIME users the right uh, resource material related to their question. So let's suppose you are a new NIME user, and I can imagine you, are, you have tons of questions, like, right, so I don't know how to access this database, I don't know how to process this data, and so on and so forth. So we said, uh, what about to create an application that in an, an, an automated manner gives the right um, links to the, to the training material that we provide on our website? And th that is why we decided to develop uh, Emil, the teacher bot. So I mentioned also nine year. Uh, just raise your hand. Does any one of you know already about nine? Okay, a few. So just to give you a little introduction about this, uh, uh, about Nine Analytics Platform. It's an open source solution um, with a graphical user interface that basically allows you to cover the overall data science life cycle, starting from reading data from any kind of data sources, and then do the ETL processing, apply machine learning models, uh, you can use it also to create reports and also to productionalize the model in a uh, production environment. So at the moment, there are more than 2,000 native uh, embedded nodes. The nodes are those blocks here that you see uh, in, this, in this slide. And each node performs a specific task. So when you connect these nodes together, you are actually creating or developing a workflow. So from the educational perspective, I work also in the evangelism team at NIME. Uh, we need to educate users about the tool, but we have also another objective, right? Which is to help the users to solve data science related problems. And users use the NIME forum uh, also for uh, for this, to ask questions related to how to use a specific uh, thing on the tool, but also how to solve a specific data science related problem. So a bot, what is a bot, is a software designed to automate all the kinds of stuff that you uh, would usually do on your own or you would ask someone else to do. And just focusing on the positive bots that are out there, we have search bots, we have teaching bots, we have communication bots, personal assistant bots, we have uh, data and develop uh, bots, we have team bots. And Emil, I mean the idea behind Emil was exactly this one, to uh, basically uh, help people new to NIME, analytics platform, to find answers uh, to their initial questions from a large amount of uh, technical tutorials that we have online. So this is more or less how we would, be, would build a bot, right? So first we start with a user's question, uh, sorry, we first start with a user interface, of course. We have to let the user ask the question with this uh, user interface. Then the bot has to understand the question. So there will be a uh, uh, text processing NLP functions that will help to extra, uh, to do all the uh, text processing um, um, procedure. And then we can, we have, we need a machine learning model to associate the right group to the, to the tutorials, to the question that has been asked. And then we need a user interface actually, again, to return the answer and eventually, if this is not mandatory, but we might need also a feedback mechanism uh, to state whether the answer was or not uh, 
of any help. So this is the UI that we built for the teacher board, for Emil. We used a web application. In this case, it's uh, a feature of the enterprise solution that we have in mind, but you can build this application with whatever uh, tool. And this is the first page, the first web page. So we started with a uh, UI that has a Nime logo, the Emil uh, feature, some greetings, and then two fields the uh, that allows the user to write the summary of the question and then the question. The, uh, the aim, in the end, is to provide the right resources to the user, right? So we provided a second uh, user uh, page, web page, where um, we actually link all the possible tutorials that might be uh, helpful for the user. So the, the user then can click on, this, on these links and then see whether the, the link is useful or not. So for example, in this case, we have a blog post that shows how to blend data from six different databases. But of course, to reach this point, um, we, I mean, we needed another, another step. So we added another page where we ask the user to give a feedback about the category that was uh, predicted by the algorithm that we, uh, that actually was uh, predicting the, the class. And this, uh, this page helped us then to uh, link the resources, re resources related to this category. So this was everything behind, or like or on, the, on, the web, on the web portal, so the, the application. And this is the workflow. I know that probably most of you never have never seen the, the workflow, a nine workflow, but I, I don't want to focus on the on the details. I just want to point you to the to the to these uh, blocks here uh, with uh, light gray color. Those we call it red meter nodes, and they contain a subflow, some nodes that allows to actually visualize uh, a web page on the web portal. So, for example, the first red meter node allows to uh, visualize the uh, the web page with a question that allows the user to write the questions. Then, actually, we have a part that is related to the, un to the understanding and the brain. Then we have a second red meter node where actually uh, we ask the user to select the category that we use then to match with the resources related to that category. And this is another part of the brain of Emil. So we have then the suggest resources red meter node that shows that allows to show on the web portal the links uh, to the technical uh, resources, the technical material, and then we have a thank you page, a goodbye. Okay, when when all this is done, we update the datasets with two different tables. In the middle, we have some if switch conditions. So, for example, if uh, if the user in the in the select category selects the the option not uh, something else or bug this is a bug or this is an announcement the uh, emil will actually redirect to a thank you page and the question will be sent to our support team we have a, another switch here in the middle of the workflow where actually um, if the if the the category uh, doesn't match any of the resources available online. This means that uh, we can't actually provide any link to the user. So even in this case, we send uh, an email to our support team and we thank you, the user. And the last if switch is when actually we provide the resources to the, to the user, but actually it doesn't find those links useful. So it can uh, click a button, send email, and this email we send to, the, to our support team. Okay, so we have seen that there are two phases where the teacher bot has to understand and make some predictions, right? And this is the understanding part, where actually we collect the, the question and we have to understand it. So we do that with text processing or text mining, right? So we transform the question in a document, 
we, we do all the tax processing phase with Plantation Erasure and Case Converter, so all the cleaning stuff. We tag the, uh, the terms that are available in our text and then we do, we do some filtering and we also do a lemmatization. So the last step is to extract the uh, most meaningful words from, from the questions, right? And here we can use a keyword uh, um, extraction model algorithm. And in this case, we decided to use the chi-square keyword extraction algorithm. So after this point, I mean, we have the list of the keywords for the question that has been asked. So the next step would be to, let's say, transform these uh, keywords in a, uh, in a document that has uh, an auto encoding, um, so with numbers, right? So we have to have a table that has numbers in there in order to apply our model. So in the end, the goals uh, for for the Emmy's brain were those. So we started with a with a question, and then we had the idea, the main idea was to provide, as I said, uh, specific resources, technical resources, right, available online. So the first thing here was to identify the areas of expertise, and this was done uh, via the machine learning approach. This means to identify the category. And the second uh, objective was to identify the list of the most relevant articles. And this was done with a similarity search approach. I will back uh, on this in a minute. So there were some parts in this project that were not that easy, let's say. So first of, first of all, defining the training problem. I will come back on this. Second of all, also building a class ontology because we had a list of uh, te technical materials, but we didn't have a class, a class system for the model that we want to wanted to train. And also creating a labeled data set. So in a perfect world, what we would have, we would have a, a data set that we, that we can somehow pre-process, and then we can split in a training set and a test set. The training set will be used to train our model, and then the test set will be used to test our model. Then we can score our model, et cetera. But actually in the real world, what do we have? We have a data set with uh, tons of missing values, and sometimes we don't have uh, classes, and we don't have labels for each row in the data set. So how can we do? I mean, we can't actually train any algorithm on that unless we, for, for example, uh, we, we train or like we use a clustering algorithm, right? Or a similarity search approach. And this is something that we can do in the first attempt of our analysis. Uh, analysis. At some point, we have to find a class system, right? And so this was the data set. So we were using uh, data from our forum, from the NIME forum, data from 2013 uh, to 2017, and those were just questions. Uh, so everyone can, can go on the NIME forum and start a new thread, ask a question from there. And we wanted to match these questions with the online resources that we have available online. So the only problem is that we had 5,000 uh, questions available on our data set, and the resources were more than 400 uh, resources available online. So any kind of machine learning uh, model actually can't actually uh, manage this kind of problem, right? There are many resources compared to the, to the number of data rows that we have available or questions. So the first thing that we did was to use a similarity search approach to match the keywords extracted from the questions available on the data set, on the nine form data set, and the online resources. But the results here were suboptimal. So we had to come up with another idea. So we decided, so we thought, okay, maybe an active learning cycle might help to, fi to basically uh, find out a better uh, class system, right? But in the end, uh, so even in this case, we had to rethink about the problem. So there was no solution because there were too many resources and we, can't, we couldn't match all of those with the questions that were available. So 
the issues in this case were, were multiple. So first of all, the selection and, and the training of a machine learning model, the definition of the areas of expertise, in this case, the class system, uh, how to set up the active learning framework, and also the implementation uh, uh, of a similarity search procedure. So about ontology, there are some, uh, so there, there is a big uh, research area on that. I mean, related to medicine, the, the easiest example is the anatomy uh, order classes. And we have another one, for example, for biology, uh, which is, for example, the interrelated animal classes. And about data science, I mean, it's the ontology corresponds to the class system, right? So we thought, okay, maybe we can somehow reduce or create an high level uh, class system from the resources that are available online. And okay, we said, okay, we have an e-learning course on the NINE website. Let's start by using these uh, classes. And we came up with uh, seven different uh, classes here, right? So installation, uh, data access, ETL, mining, control, deployment, and data visualization. Those are all the things that are covered in our e-learning course. Then we said, okay, wait, because on our, if you, if you look on our website, we have different use cases. We have uh, uh, also something that talks about the text processing, processing extension. We have big data related topics. We have server related topics, image processing related topics, and also reporting. So we came up in the end with, we have seven plus six, uh, here uh, 13 classes. But yeah, we said, okay, probably this is not enough because then looking at the question and at the questions on the data set, we saw that actually there were questions related to development, integrations, the different integrations that NIME provides. Uh, how to optimize uh, nine workflows, how uh, problems or like uh, use cases related to life science or new announcements uh, or bugs or legal stuff. Okay, so in the end, we decided to create a class system with these 20 uh, different classes. So we reduced uh, our class system for 400, from 400, 400 uh, resources to 20 uh, classes. So as I said, we started with a training set with the forum questions. And here the first attempt was to use a similarity search criterion to match the, uh, the, class, the classes with the, with the questions. We said that this was suboptimal as a result. So then we, we said, okay, we can use active learning for this. So we, we train our model and then we extract the most uh, uncertain predictions. We let a teammate or myself to label some of these, uh, some of these uncertain predictions. Then we, as I said, we do the relabeling and then we, we extend the class label to the, to the, to the closest uh, prediction. So we can, we can actually iterate on this cycle. And we are talking about active learning. So we can train again the model, extract the most uncertain predictions, relabel the, the most uncertain prediction, and then extend the class label with, with the closest prediction. And do that until we reach uh, the point that the data set doesn't change that much, right? So that we have labels that are more or less um, fixed for, for, the, for the roles that we are using on our data set. Okay, so this is the active learning cycle, or in general, the, uh, how EMIS have been, has been built. So we have uh, the user interface part, and then we have the NIME ontology model. We train our model, and then we have uh, we have our active learning cycle in there. If we look in the details, this active learning cycle, we see that, I mean, as we have seen, we have an initial labeling phase, a training set, and a model training. Then we choose the subset to be labeled. And here we start with, with the active learning cycle. With the uh, initial labeling we used uh, was, was based on distance. 
and the model training was used, uh, we used a random forest model. Going into deta details, here the subset that was chosen with the most uh, predicted classes uh, was the 10% of the uncertain classes. And this was the difference between the three top probabilities for each predicted classes. So we first labeled the predicted class, the classes, or the something else, and then the something else option, or like category that was available in the choose category um, in, the, in the second uh, web page, we, uh, we labeled manually with a specific category. So then we extend this, uh, this uh, category to, uh, to the closest prediction with a uh, key nearest neighbor equal to co with k equal to one. So we basically keep going on this until we reach like a fixed uh, version of the data set. And this is what, uh, so like the evolution of, of, of the data set. So uh, the changes in the training set. In the first iteration, so we used only the similarity approach. And in this case, what we did, we used our classes, we used uh, the classes, uh, the ontology that we defined, and then we used the, the questions on the forum. And we ended up that uh, with, with this similarity uh, criteria approach, uh, most, of the, most of the classes were related to installation, which is the most prominent um, topic related to get started with NIME, right? In the second iteration, when uh, we started using active learning and also the machine learning approach, we saw that the most prominent topic was ETL. And this makes sense. I mean, in the end, we are talking about data science life cycle, and ETL is the most prominent topic, right? And so we saw that in the third iteration, the second iteration, sorry, sorry, the third iteration, the one that is uh, here depicted as AL iteration two, uh, the, the data set didn't change them mu that much. So we saw that there were some minor changes in the smallest topics, but in the end, ETL and some others were already fixed, right? So we decided to don't continue with, uh, with the active learning cycle. And here we have a bar chart that shows in the different phases uh, what were the topics or like the labels that uh, the classes that were most prominent. So about the evolution of the, of the answers. So we saw that actually there was no improvement in the accuracy. And at the beginning, this was kind of weird. But in the end, uh, we saw an improvement in the way in the links that were provided to the users based on the question that was asked. So this means that accuracy is not always meaningful, right, for the problem that you are uh, working on. Also because we were working on 20 different classes, so the accuracy can be that high. And just to, uh, I mean, we, we have built a bunch of workflows to make all this application work. And the everything worked out pretty well, but so we decided also to uh, reuse some of the components that were available in different workflows. And we did it with microservices. So one of the main advantage uh, of, microser of microservices is being able to re reuse a smaller part of the, the workflows, right? Or the components of the project that we are working on. And in this way, we can make it more efficient. In NIME, there are, the, I mean, we, we have one way to do this, to, to create microservices. So at the beginning, what we did, we used uh, Mitterow templates. So again, those are like subflows that we can reuse it. So we create templates, and then we can just drag and drop directly on the, on the canvas and then reuse it. And to change this in a microservice, we just replaced the, uh, the template, the Mitterow template, with a with the so-called call remote workflow node. So what it does, this node, basically it calls the execution of another workflow that is stored in our explorer, okay? So in the end, what uh, we ended up with a series or a number of workflows 
and a number of microservices that were called throughout this uh, co-remote workflow node. And the, as you can see here in this slide, here we have uh, an example of microservice. So this is just to show you that everything works with a, uh, so when you call an external workflow or like a microservice, uh, you always communicate with JSON. So you always pass a JSON file, so that the workflow takes as input a JSON, then you transform this JSON in a table, NIME table in this case, something that can be uh, handled by NIME, and then we, you do all the uh, processing or analysis, in this case was a prediction, and then you uh, transform back everything as a JSON file. So the, the core remote workflow get back the, the results. So what I tried to show here in this, in this presentation was uh, how to create a basic bot. Uh, also the text processing that involves uh, the understanding of the question that uh, was asked by the user, as well as the keyword extraction, how to build an ontology, which is, a, let's say, it's a really important task to do when, when you don't have a data set that, uh, that has a class system how to assign labels with the active learning cycle, and also how to convert uh, reusable subflow into microservices. What did we learn during this project? Well, so we, we learned that the NIME forum is often used as educational tool, so often there are people that ask, okay, how can I do this, or how can I connect to this, or that, etc. Uh, that keyword extraction is a plus with respect to the keyword search. So there are two different, so those are, that should be a uh, separation between those two different topics. And to readjust the class system uh, from time to time, I mean, in the end, we find out that, found out that uh, we had 20 uh, class, uh, classes, right? But if you look into, into more details at the data set, maybe you, find out that might be that there are more classes to take into account, right, to make better uh, predictions. So it's better also when you, are, when you have new data coming in to readjust your class system. And of course we learned that accuracy, accuracy is not all, so it's not the most important thing to look at. And also from the questions that we found out on the forum, we said, okay, probably we have to provide, or like we have to create new educational material for, um, for data visualization. And also maybe to create a new blog post for related to how to optimize the NIME workflows. Okay, so there are several ways to extend this project. So first of all, for, uh, for with uh, word embedding. So in, this so in our case, we used autoencoding uh, transformation. But the thing is that the document vector node leads to a big and sparse uh, future space. So we can improve this uh, by training a vector representation with word to vec uh, Another implementation that uh, we could add to our project is using the Keras integration for LSTM. NIME integrates also Keras in this case, so this might be also another, uh, another implementation and also investigate the role of, a, of the parameters that we have used. So in this case, the 10% of a certainty, uh, the, the K equal to one for the key nearest neighbor, or maybe if we forgot some other functions that uh, might uh, be helpful to uh, have a better prediction. Uh, another thing that we could do is also to add speech recognition and maybe add the YouTube videos that uh, we, we have on our um, Nine TV channel. So all this stuff basically might be helpful to extend our project. Okay, so what we have done, so all of this stuff uh, has been published uh, with a series of blog posts. So if you are interested in, in this topic, you can find out more on the Nine uh, website. We also uh, published the workflows that we have been working on. 
and this is all available on a public server uh, that you can access to uh, from Nyman Analytics platform directly. And yeah, we have also a white paper. So if you go on the on the section related to the white papers, you can also find out the, the white paper related to Emil, the teacher bot. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.